Good evening, Sycamore. Thank you for being with me again as we study a lesson from God's Word. And thank you for being with me all these weeks that we've been uh, unable to gather together as uh, we usually do. And uh, hopefully that time's coming to an end and we can gather together on Sunday evenings and Wednesday evenings very soon. But thanks again for uh, studying the Bible with me. I want to share a lesson with you tonight entitled, If We Forget. If you would, look with me in Luke chapter 12. And we're going to begin reading there in verse 35. Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 35. Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. And you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding. That when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. And if he should come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. How many times has Jesus taught us to be watching? How many times has Jesus said to us, be diligent, be observant, be watching? A man by the name of George Santayana said, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. About five years ago, I pulled up in my drive in, in my garage and I stepped out of the truck and I fell. I fell out of my truck. Now, I'm almost glad that we're not together because it hurts my feelings when you laugh at me for that, but I kind of deserve it because you know, falling out of my truck wasn't the worst part of it. The worst part was that's the third time I'd done it. See, I have these shoes that are kind of slippery and the garage floor was a little bit slippery and and I knew that I knew better but I just stepped right out and I didn't think about it I wasn't paying attention I forgot and I bounced my chin off the floor it had been a while and I had forgotten the danger I guess and I paid the price for it you know, God's Word teaches us that as His children, we must be diligent at all times. And that's a word I want you to remember as we go through our lesson tonight. Diligent. 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 27, the Apostle Paul said, But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Paul said that if I'm not diligent, I can lose what I have. You know, there are people out there and there are denominations out there even that will teach that once you're saved, you're always saved. But the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible says if you're not diligent, you can lose your salvation. Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, you got to be watching. What God has given you, you must protect and you must develop and you must hold on to. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12 says, Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Galatians 6 and verse 9, And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap, if we do not lose heart. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 2, and verse 15, it says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. New King James language there says, Be diligent. The King James says, Study. Study to show thyself approved. Now that word study has a connotation of reading and then going further. Not just reading, but, but adding to that reading and, and growing in that reading, being diligent, not only to know what God said, but 
to do also what God has said. Turn over with me now to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, as we think about diligence. Beginning in verse 5, we read this, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse nine, for he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We sometimes call these in first, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, second Peter chapter one, Christian graces. And we are to take our faith and we are to be diligent to add these things, virtue and knowledge and self-control and patience and godliness and brotherly kindness. He who lacks these things, verse 9 says, has forgotten that he was cleansed of his sins. You mean we can forget? How hard-headed can we be? Well, it's hard to tell that. I told you a minute ago I fell out of my truck three times. Now, I haven't done it in the last five years or six years, however long it's been. So maybe I finally learned. But if I forget again, it'll even be worse than the other three times. You see, each time it got a little progressively worse. Jesus told us in Luke chapter 12 to watch. You and I know as children of God, that we ought to be watching for the return of Jesus, that we ought to be preparing for the return of Jesus, that we ought to be warning other people of the return of Jesus. Why does he tell us to be diligent? Why does he tell us to be watching? Because we know that our adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. 1 Peter 5 and verse 8. He waits for us to let our guard down. He waits for us to forget our salvation. He waits for us to forget to watch. For the rest of the time that we have this evening, what I want us to do is look at what happens when we forget. There's three things that happen when we forget to watch for Jesus' return. When we fail to be diligent to watch for his coming, the first thing that happens to us when we forget is that we don't do the things that we should. We don't do the things that we should. Over in the book of James, chapter 1, we read there, beginning in verse 21, James writes, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself and goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. James goes on to say, if anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. 
See, we deceive ourselves if we forget. We deceive ourselves and we begin to think, well, I have plenty of time. I, uh, nothing has happened yet, so maybe nothing will happen. And we hear and we know, but we fail to do. We don't notice the things in our lives that need to be done because we simply forgot that Jesus is coming back. Religion is defined by the things that we do, bridling our tongue, visiting the sick, or the, sick the orphans, the widows, those who need help. That word visiting doesn't mean to stop by and say hi, and if I can do anything for you, it means giving what you can to those who need it. Seeing what they need and then supplying that need. Bridling the tongue because Jesus is coming back. If we look over in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 24, we find there Jesus speaking again, beginning in verse 45. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods, but if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come in a day, on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour that he is not aware of and will cut him in two and appoint his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You see, forgetting the mission that we have been given, forgetting to watch for the Lord and live as if he is coming will cause faithful and wise servants to become evil. And we will move from being prepared to being unprepared. Going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, Paul said, lest when I have preached to others, I myself might become disqualified. He said, that's why I discipline myself so that I don't forget to do what I'm telling other people to do. Paul says, I must be diligent. You know, if the apostle Paul needed to be diligent, then so do I. You know, if we forget the little things of life, we'll someday learn that all things are little things. You know, I don't need to do that. Somebody else will do that. That's just a small thing anyway. That's below my talent level. You know, there are people who actually think that. I don't need to do that. I don't need to participate in that. that that's really beneath me. I have so much more talent. If you do think that about yourself, remember that it was Jesus who girded himself with a towel and washed the disciples' feet. You see, if we forget the little things, one of these days we're going to learn that all things are little things. See, you and I aren't capable of big things. You and I can't do big things. Say, well, that's insulting. Well, that's just the truth. How many big things has the scripture taught us to do? Go into all the world and preach the gospel. How does that work? Just like we spoke about this morning in our, our worship service, we teach one at a time and that one goes out and reaches others. See, we can't evangelize the world, but we can evangelize a small part of the world. We can't do big things. We do the small things. We plant and we sow and, and, and we water. But God gives the increase. Therefore, everything we do could be classified as a small thing. If we forget the little things, we'll someday learn that all things are little things. Second of all, we will someday come to know that there are no little things. Say, well, that, that's contradictory. No, 
You see, everything is small, but when you give it to God, he can make big things of it. Remember Matthew chapter 25, the, 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 the story of the sheep and the goats? What was the difference in the sheep and the goats? Was it big things? No. The, the goats didn't feed the hungry. They didn't, uh, they didn't visit the sick, those who were in prison. They didn't give clothes to the naked. But those who were the sheep did those things. Not earth-shattering things, not things that changed the whole world, but things that needed to be done, where they needed to be done, when they needed to be done. Because Jesus is coming back. A cup of water, an encouraging word, a visit, a card, a hug, a tear shared with someone whose heart is broken. All things are important if done in the name of the Lord. See, when we forget Jesus is coming back, then we don't do the things that we should. We're not as diligent as we ought to be. And that gets us into trouble. Secondly, if we forget, then we fail to treat people as we should. If we forget that Jesus is coming back, then we fail to treat people the way that we ought to treat people. Do you know how you ought to treat people? Sure you do. If you're a child of God, or even if you're not, if you happen to be watching this and you're not a Christian and, and you never have been and you don't know a whole lot about the Bible, I promise you, you know this. It's what the world has come to know as the golden rule. And paraphrased, it's simply this, to treat other people the way you want to be treated. We know how to treat people, folks. God's word is very clear on how we are to treat people. In Hebrews 13 and verse 2, we're told by the Hebrew writer to not forget to entertain strangers. We know we must be hospitable to people. Matthew 7 and verse 1 tells us, uh, judge not that you be not judged. We know that we're not supposed to harshly judge other people. We know that we are supposed to forgive it's, it's hard to do, but we know that we're supposed to forgive and we're supposed to let the past be in the past when sins have been repented of. Matthew chapter 18 gives us the parable of the unmerciful servant. If you remember, the master forgave the servant his debt of 10,000 talents, but then he turned around and he would not forgive a hundred denarii. He was forgiven a great deal, but he wouldn't forgive just a little bit. If we forget what God has forgiven in us, then we're never going to be able to forgive others the way that we should. We must treat other people the way we want to be treated. And Jesus said in Matthew 7 and verse 12, Whatsoever you'd have doing to you, do ye also unto them. Whatsoever you'd have men doing to you, do ye also unto them. For this is the law and the prophets. You know what's meant by that? That everything that you need to do in this word, as it relates to other people, can be summed up in this. Treat other people the way you want to be treated. That along with Loving God and loving your neighbor is the whole Bible, Jesus said. Because if you love God, you'll keep his commandments, John 14, 15. And you must love your neighbor as yourself. And if you'll keep those commandments and love like you ought to love, it covers everything in Scripture. If we forget that Jesus is coming back, we fail to do what we're supposed to do and we fail to treat people as we should. One other thing is a result of our forgetting. If we forget that Jesus is coming back, 
then we mistake the patience of God for slackness or for allowance. Over in 2 Peter chapter 3, I want to read to you the first nine verses of that chapter. As we think about, is God slack? Does God forget? Or does God allow us to live any way that we want to live and do whatever we want to do? Look with me in 2 Peter chapter 3 and let's read together. Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation, for this they willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, verse 8, do not forget this one thing that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He says to us specifically, do not forget that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. The scoffers of old and the scoffers of today would say, well, Jesus said it was 2,000 years ago when Jesus said, I'm coming back. Well, where is he? He hasn't come back yet. Therefore, he's probably not coming back anytime soon, if he's coming back at all. Don't forget, folks, that time means nothing to the Lord. Time is something that the Lord created for us. We operate on time, we operate on days and months and years, seconds and minutes and hours. God doesn't. With God, a day is as a thousand years, a thousand years as a day. You and I uh, sometimes look at that and we try to take that literally. All he's saying is God's not bound by time. So don't you forget he's coming back just because he hasn't. We mistake sometimes the patience of God for slackness or for allowance of sin. God is patient. He is long-suffering, but God is also just and his promises endure. God doesn't forget. God doesn't condone sin. God doesn't allow sin. Just because God doesn't strike you dead when you think the wrong thing or say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing doesn't mean that he condones what you did. What it means is he's given you opportunity to make it right. He wants all of us to repent. He wants all of us to come to him. You know, the same words that spoke this world into existence will usher it right out. One of these days, God will say to his son, it's time, and it'll all be over. We do not have plenty of time. We don't have time to slack off or forget our mission to forget why we, why we are here and to forget that Jesus is coming back and that we will stand before him in judgment. We will give an account of the things done in this body. If we forget that, we're not going to be prepared when he comes back. You know, all of these things are symptoms of forgetfulness and weakness. When we forget to do the things or stop doing the things we're supposed to do, when we stop treating each other 
like we should. And when we begin to think that God maybe is he's not coming. When we fail to see that, we get ourselves into trouble. I told you about falling out of my truck. Well, each time it's happened, it's been a little worse. First, I held on to the truck door. The first time, I, I grabbed hold of the truck door, and so it wasn't really that bad. The next time, I used my hands to break my fall. I made it all the way to the floor, but I stopped myself. But the third time, I hit my chin on the floor. If it happens again, if it happened to me again, it's probably going to be worse. You know, I think it's the same way with us spiritually. Each time we allow ourselves to forget, we fall just a little bit harder. Each time we allow ourselves to forget that Jesus is going to return and that I'm going to be accountable to him, each time we allow ourselves to forget that something bad happens and each time it's a little bit harder, it's a little bit worse. So we need to work harder to make sure we don't forget. We read Luke chapter 12, verses 35 through 38. Blessed is he. Blessed is the servant who when his master comes will find him watching. When Jesus comes, will he find us watching? You know, God wants to forgive. He will forgive. He wants to forgive. And he waits to forgive. But he won't wait forever. There's coming a day it's appointed by God when Jesus is going to return. Are you ready for that day? Think about your own life and, and, and examine yourself. Have you forgotten that Jesus is coming back? Oh, no, 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 no I've never forgotten that. Everybody knows that. I, and, and, and that's what my whole faith is based on. Are you living that way? Are you doing what you ought to do with the passion and the zeal that you ought to do it? Are you treating people the way that you should? Are you, are you counting God's patience as slackness or as if maybe he has forgotten? We know better than to do that. You know better than to do that. I know better than to do that. So we've got to be diligent. We've got to be diligent to make our call and election sure. One of the things that we find from uh, 2 Peter 1, verse 10, that we need to be diligent to make our call and election sure. Folks, the call is sure. Is our election sure? Is the call that you're following from God and are you following it to the best of your ability? The good news is because you're able to watch this right now, you're able to examine yourself in light of the word of God. And if you find yourself lacking, friend, it's time to do something about it. It's time to confess that sin, to repent and to come back to the Lord. He waits for you and he calls for you. If there's anything we can do for you at Sycamore, please let us know. We'd be glad to help you in any way. We'd be glad to study with you, to pray for you, to walk with you. I want to say again how much I appreciate you being with me tonight. And, and I pray that you will uh, study through some of these scriptures that we've, uh, we've gone over tonight. Look at yourself, your life, and your heart. Are you living as if Jesus is coming back? We know we should. We need to change if we're not. 
I look forward to seeing you at Sycamore just as soon as we possibly can. I just uh, I invite you to come and be with us. Uh, we're we're, we're uh, a bunch of people who are doing our best to follow the Word of God and get to heaven. And we'd love to share that experience with you. We would love to have you come and to be a part of us. We'd love to have you visit with us. We'd come love to have you study with us. We'd just love to have you and, and to have you with us anytime that you have the opportunity. I thank you once again for being with me, and God bless you.